How are you doing? Good, good. Good to see you, So um, we all know that you've, you've had some wonderful patients over the years and work with some amazing organizations, specifically the Lakers and the Kings. Um, I'm excited that LeBron's back and going to be leading the team here in LA. What are your thoughts on him being uh, the leader of the organization? Well, he's proven himself to be a great leader and a great champion and a great athlete. Yeah. And uh, I think the Lakers are probably still maybe one key player away from contending for a championship. But, you know, LeBron's won championships with uh, less talent around him than he has in L.A. at the moment. And, and the Lakers have some great young players. So it's, it's certainly going to be a very exciting season. He definitely knows how to take control of the situation and, and bring in those wins, for sure. Absolutely. So losing Kobe was a tough situation, but to have somebody of that caliber to be the leader and, and uh, both as LA natives, it's kind of cool to, to see that energy and drive back in the city again. So I'm excited. Uh, maybe we'll go to a Laker game together at some point. Yeah, <laughs> definitely a basketball town. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, of LeBron, I know you had done his LASIK uh, and he's made some amazing comments about that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how he found you and, and uh, what performance matrix, metrics you look for in professional athletes? Yeah, that's a lot of questions all in one. You know, LeBron and I uh, met through word of mouth, uh, through his uh, uh, NBA contacts, and uh, um, we got to know each other, and, and I had operated on a number of uh, NBA athletes before that. And uh, being as competitive as he is and wanting to be at the absolute top of his game, he didn't want to leave any stones unturned. He wanted his vision to be as crisp as possible also. So we were very happy to be able to help him out. That was a long time ago. That was maybe, uh, my guess is maybe 11 years ago. And what's interesting is that the um, LASIK you performed, he was, what was interesting to me is a lot of times patients may ask, how quickly can I get back to work? And how quickly can I get back into my routine? And he was back to practice, what, the next day after his LASIK? Well, we find, uh, yeah, we find that the professional athletes, uh, you know, they're professional athletes for good reason. They're, they're compulsive about being at the top of their game. Sure. So you're not going to keep a guy like him away from going back to practice immediately. I've had professional athletes who asked if they could go practice the same day, and I'm, my guess is some of them did. Yeah. <laughs> You know, certainly there's nothing wrong with giving yourself a day off, I think. But uh, the beauty of the LASIK procedure and the way we developed it for professional athletes, the whole intention was to uh, optimize both vision recovery and uh, at that level of competition, whether it's tennis, you could get hit in the eye with the ball, football, soccer, uh, basketball, boxing. You know, we've even operated on a lot of martial arts uh, professionals. Um, at that level of competition, they get hit in the face all the time. Sure. You know, they just don't sit around and cry about it, so people don't really notice. But in a, in a typical basketball game, if you ever rewind a basketball game and watch how many times people get hit in the head, it's astounding. And so we had developed our technique of LASIK many years ago, specifically with high contact sports professional athletes in mind where we rotated the hinge of the flap out here because you have bony prominences down below, nasally and superiorly. And so the technique that I had developed, we referred to it as uh, elasic or elliptical because we customized the shape of the flap for the shape of the eye and also put the hinge out here so that if you, they did get hit for any reason Chances due to trauma. This, yeah, the, there was no concern about returning early to competitive interaction. So when patients are choosing LASIK, it's important for them to kind of decide who to go to or where, where to have the LASIK perform. So what makes the Institute so special and why are patients choosing? Um, you know, if you sell apples on a street corner, uh, if you're an apple vendor and you sell the shiniest apples and you really make sure they're fresh and you make sure they're clean and, you, and you're pleasant to the people that come by, probably over the years, your chances are you're gonna sell more apples than than the next person. And that's the approach that we've always taken, which is 
provide the absolute best level of care that you're capable of, never cutting any corners, always trying to, to make sure that every treatment has stacked into it the right portfolio of uh, gadgets and uh, the best that technology has to offer, but you also think through how you're gonna customize it for this individual, what are their specific needs. And so that's always been our uh, objective, and we're, I think it would be fair to say that we're very love-based as an organization, and patients want to be loved by their doctors. It's just, it's very simple. They're not looking to go to, to an accountant's office or an engineer's office, not that those folks aren't love-based also, but when you come to a doctor, you know, as a child, when I was sick, I wanted the doctor to be kind and loving and gentle and sweet. Yeah. And so we, we provide those things, and so over the years, our results, uh, we've been very lucky. We've participated in a lot of FDA uh, studies, and we've been pioneers and the first in the world to do a lot of different surgeries, a lot of which are still actively currently produ uh, provided treatments around the world. And we put a big emphasis from early on on, on giving back to the community, not just charity work, but I think equally importantly, or possibly more importantly, training other doctors. Because if I do charity work somewhere, say in Africa, I've done charity work from Haiti to Mexico, all kinds of places, I'm not there to follow up those patients. But if I train a surgeon in Mexico or Haiti and give them good skills, they're there to deliver care for thousands of patients over time. Paying it forward, yeah, right. And so a lot of those surgeons now, you know, I, more than 10,000 doctors have been to my courses, a lot of them, uh, refer to us right here in our own backyard it's relationships like ours you know <laughs> where you feel like you're taking care of a patient with a friend and it seems seamless too it's not like there's a disconnect and that's that's what I really work like uh, when we work together at, here at the Institute is that um, it's a handoff it's that whole relationship of going back to the sports analogy of like Jordan and Pippen right where it's that nice assist that I give to you and then it's a nice handoff right back to me and the patients come back saying thank you for that referral and you guys are an extension of us. So whether we're sending out to a retinal specialist or a LASIK surgeon or um, an orthopedic surgeon, um, patients want to know that they expect the best from, from us and we hope that they get the same care when we pass them off to, um, to have those procedures performed. So I, I really appreciate that, truly. Um, going back to some of these, these patients like the athletes, what performance metrics uh, oh, yeah, you do you guys do you guys Sorry. look for? I probably um, went off on a big tangent. That's okay. The uh, so you're asking a Let's great question about performance <laughs> metrics, and you're you're asking a great question about um, about why athletes. Kind of that's what I meant early on when I said you're asking several questions in one. You know, first off, why athletes be so. Uh, prioritized sure. when it comes to scrutinizing um, how we're gonna, you know, whether, whether we want to treat them or not. It's because their career is compressed into a very short period of time. People forget the average NFL player's career is less than five years. Even in, in most major sports, the average career is less than five years, whether you pick soccer, this or that. You know, there's a few super athletes, we follow them for yeah. 10, 15 <laughs> years, and we think everybody plays for 20 years. No, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was an anomaly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Even Kobe, was it close all to these, 20 all years? These, look at LeBron, you know, look at LeBron. He's played more games than, than, than probably by a factor of two than the average NBA professional does in their entire career. What you find is in, in the young NBA players or the young soccer players or the NFL players where they're playing a lot of night games or in funny lights. So in the case of soccer especially and, and the NFL, they play a lot of night games. Sure. Environment's very different for night games. Pupils dilate up, the ball's getting kicked 50 meters, 60 meters, right? Yeah. They have to time it just right. You actually want them to be a little farsighted because they're young enough, and even when they're exhausted, they still have enough zooming power in the lenses of their eye. You don't want them to be just perfect 2020 in the exam lane because what happens is if you have them at that, their night vision performance isn't quite as crisp. Right. And the same with the three, you know, by the time you get out to the three point zone, you want to be a little bit farsighted. Especially these younger players, they're so charged up and amped up, they get a little bit of accommodation. So, so you, they're going to feel, if you make them what you and I consider 2020, where we, we drive around, we see Gray, and we go into a restaurant, we read a menu and all that, 
that, that's not putting them at the top of their game. So I put them a little over the top. And that works out nicely for so them. So that's that extra value you're adding is that you're not just cookie cutter and right. getting them to 20, simple right. 2020. You're focusing and customizing it, not just customizing the LASIK based off of the shape of their eye, but customizing it based off of their lifestyle. Right. And that's what's amazing about what you do here at the Institute. Is I would like to start to gather statistics on the, on the athlete's performances before and after eye surgery so we can have an objective metric of, you know, the guy got a year older, right? So if he's 18, you could argue he hasn't come into his prime yet. That Wimbledon champion that I told you that, that I operated on brought his son. His son is a junior in, the, in Europe, but he's becoming a rising star really fast. And he sent me a note, he said, you know, he at the Holland um, uh, National Facility for Testing Athletes, he says to me, Carrie, they said they, they've rarely seen anybody with this kind of vision. I had done LASIK on the kid. Um, he says, uh, they said his number, his vision is 2.0 in one eye and 2.5 in the other. What, what exactly does that mean? I said, oh, well, 2.0 is 2010 and 2.5 is 28, which approaches the limit of the human potential of the retina. So that's what they're saying. He's like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you know? <Screaming> vision. Yeah. <laughs> one, a couple of final notes are, um, I know that we're always striving for constant and never-ending improvement in our personal lives, in our relationships, and with our patients and especially with technology. Can you tell us what's on the horizon in terms of refractive surgery and um, what's to come? Yeah, I think there's a few exciting things. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, when you say that, one of the questions I get asked by people all the time is should I wait five years or 10 years? I tell them, you know, there'll be better cars, certainly in five or 10 years, but I wouldn't walk to work in the meantime. You know, we've already gotten to the level of being able to deliver refractive surgery up to the retinal potential of the individual. So even though our technology gets better, we might hit those numbers more often, we're not gonna be able to use refractive surgery to surpass what a person's retinal potential is gonna be. So there's certainly good things coming along, but I wouldn't walk to work in the meantime. I had my surgery initially um, 24 years ago. I, I wanna say maybe 25 years ago. I forget the math now, either 1993 or 1994. Um, and, you know, for all those years, I've enjoyed, you know, I had 2010 vision for, for what seemed like forever. Um, and so, and that was obsolete technology now. You know, we don't do that surgery for anybody anymore. Um, and so, so there will be good things coming, but I, I you know, uh, if a person has become intolerant of contact lenses, I wouldn't tell them continue to wear your contacts and tough it out because they could get a really bad infection. You know? so, so I think existing technology is certainly good enough, but what's on the horizon? So what's on the horizon is several things. One is the presbya corneal inlay, which is still undergoing FDA um, review, so I'm not sure if it'll get released or not, but it is by far the best inlay that I've ever worked with. Uh, you know, Everybody thinks, oh, science evolves so rapidly. Science does it revolve rapidly, but the application of science in medicine can take a very long time. The Presbya micro lens, which used to be called a completely different thing when we first started working with it, I've worked on that project for close to 20 years now. And only now we're, and what it is, is it's a contact lens about in volume, maybe two or three percent the volume of a normal contact lens, but it fits in the cornea, front and center. And what it does is it doesn't take the place of contact lenses. What it does is it's a treatment for presbyopia. So instead of my doing LASIK on one eye, say, to, to give them reading vision in that eye, what we do now is we'll implant that so that the person can continue with that eye to enjoy pretty good distance vision. Of course, the other eye, we make it perfect for distance, say with LASIK where they already see perfect, but they can see X on top close. So if they finally get binocular distance, so it's like Monovision Plus, nice. where it's not one eye for near, one eye for distance. Both eyes are for distance, but they, they can also have that binocular vision for distance, right. but they can also see and the it menu. Has, yes, it has the benefits restaurant. where it's transparent, so you don't know it's there. Nobody sees it, it's underneath the surface. The patient doesn't water it or use eye drops or anything like that, they're done. Uh, but you could also remove it. Let's say their needs change. Let's say they develop a cataract later and they need cataract surgery. It's easy to go in there, take that out, go back to ground zero and move ahead. And I've implanted these overseas. I started implanting them about 15 years ago um, in Mexico initially, um, in Mexico City actually. And, uh, and, and since then in other uh, 
places over the, around the world. I've seen patients who had had it in five or six years earlier. I went and exchanged it for higher power because the lens in their eye changed. So this is titratable. It's not a one size fits all. It's not like the um, camera inlay, you know? Yeah. Um, the the difficulty with the camera too. inlay was, yeah, it was a one size shoe fits all, and therefore we had to pick the patients that were in the sweet spot, and there was very few of those. And then, and then sometimes we would even put those in, and, and we, got, we thought we got a great result, but the patient wasn't happy because their friends would notice the dark thing that was sitting in their eye. This is transparent, so, so that's exciting. Um, Johnson Johnson is about to raise the bar in LASIK. Um, by uh, releasing the next generation of Wavefront, which takes both Wavefront and combines it with topography, and we think will get us even more accurate data. Is that considered topo-guided LASIK, or is that it's No, topo-guided is just topo-guided. This is Wavefront Combining. topography augmented. So it's true Wavefront and topography augmented. Nobody else has the product. They're, 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 they're the only game the only with one. that right now, yeah. And that'll be the next level of yeah, LASIK so it takes, it takes eye design to the next level. You know, what eye design did for LASIK is enabled us to more consistently hit better than 2020. Okay, when I measure you for glasses, I can measure you kind of like this and like this, you know, in two dimension, and I can give you a best ballpark. But what about all these little tiny dots in between? One of them is maybe a little, you know, this part of my eyes has a slightly higher power, this other part is slightly lower. Wavefront was supposed to deliver on that. The wave scan simply couldn't. It was just not accurate enough. It didn't have enough pencils of light. It didn't have enough accuracy in each pencil of light. A lot, lot of algorithms I don't want to get into. iDesign delivers on that promise. It's much more accurate. It puts out enough pencils of light and can distinguish between adjacent bundles. Because the problem with WaveScan, for example, is if you think of it, what it would do is it would send a pencil of light in and, and it comes back and it measures that one, sends another one and measures that, and it measures the aberrations in these. But what if the eye has such high aberrations that when the pencils of light come back, they crisscross? Mm. The system couldn't tell them apart. And, but the eye design can do that. So, so we have now the ability to deliver on better than we could hope to with a pair of glasses. And uh, so, so that's exciting. Um, on the, Do you feel like um, manage, I know you guys, we, we've shared a number of patients for, for surgery, but also for dry eyes. Do you feel like um, relieving dry eyes has had any positive outcomes on your LASIK or cataract patients? You know, the eye is like a camera, and you realize that, I realize that. But in the analogy of a camera, if you have a lens on that camera that's not finely polished, you're not going to take the, the same quality photographs. The tear film of the eye is that polishing agent. It takes, if we took the surface of a human eye and magnified it large enough under electron microscopy, the cells would take on a mosaic pattern like this. Well, what fills the gap between these adjacent ones so when the light hits it doesn't scatter? The tear film. And so without a good tear film, you're not gonna have superhuman vision. I don't care who you are. When I wake up with my usual insomnia at three o'clock in the morning and my brain is too busy and I decide to sit and work. If I, only, if I went to bed at one o'clock and I got up at three o'clock, my eyes are so tired, I'm so dry, I can't, I can't see. <laughs> you know, it takes me a while to wake them up. And um, so, so managing dry eyes is critical and I know you specialize in that and that's one of the things I love is by the time you send me a patient, I don't have to spend time managing that issue and getting them ready. They're ready to go by the time I see them. Uh, and of course, that field of dry eye therapy is, is rapidly evolving. You know, uh, I wrote a white paper 20 something years ago in St. Louis touting what a super drug doxycycline is because of all the things it does besides being an antibiotic. And uh, the company that, that asked me to write it was Alcon, and they took it, they said, This is great, it's doing nice in Europe, but, but, but you know, it's kind of esoteric. And now, Many years later, people came back and said, oh, you know, oil gland deficiency is the number one cause of dry eye. And that's what the doxycycline was speaking to back then. We didn't have all the great stuff, lipid flow and delight and, you know, all the other stuff that tools that are available to us now and, and the great eye drops. You know, I think, uh, uh, I think it might have been Refresh was like the first eye drop that came out that was non-preserved, you know. And, and before that, people were pouring battery acid on their eyes, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to deal with dry eyes. I mean, 
Rem goodness. Home remedies. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, no. The, the eye drops that existed had all these preservatives in them, and the preservatives were eventually beat up on the eyes. The you know. Yeah, all that stuff. Um, well, it's been an amazing time with you today, so I really appreciate you kind of going through all this with me, and um, I hope our relationship continues to evolve into something amazing, and look forward to sharing numerous patients together. So you said I kissed the boxer, but, but all I get out of you is a handshake. I love you. <laughs>